Hi everyone. In this video, I would like to discuss some of the main points of The Challenge of Cultural Relativism by James Rachels. Notice that the author's last name is Rachels. Rachels with an S, and his first name is James. Also note that it is customary to refer to an author by his or her last name unless you are first introducing him or her for the first time in a paper. I bring this up because in the past sometimes students have thought that this author was a woman and called him Rachel. Cultural relativism is often used synonymously with the terms ethical relativism or moral relativism. According to the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, moral relativism is the view that moral judgments are true or false only relative to, a, uh, to some particular standpoint. For instance, that of a culture or a historical period and that no standpoint is uniquely privileged over all others. Now, in my experience, most beginners to ethics tend toward a view I call naive cultural relativism. The use of the word naive is not meant to be demeaning or to make a value judgment. By naive cultural relativism, I mean that most people come to their first ethics course believing without considering arguments for, for and against that there are no objective moral truths and that all moral behavior is culturally relative or subjectively relative. Now, after this week, you may still be a moral relativist, but at least you will have some knowledge of the arguments, so you will no longer be naive. Now, James Rachels was an American philosopher who specialized in ethics and animal rights. Whether one agrees with him or not, most people agree that he is a very good writer. And I think he does a great job explaining cultural relativism, the arguments in its favor, and the arguments against it. Note that his position is against cultural relativism. In this course, sometimes articles or excerpts will be chosen because the person is a good writer, and sometimes they will be chosen because the article or excerpt is of such historical importance that even though the writing may not be easy to understand, it is essential to read it to get the main ideas of the view in question. Keep in mind that one of the main challenges of a humanities class is to read difficult tasks, uh, texts and interpret them. I'm here to help you do that, and I welcome any clarifying questions that you have. But ultimately, you will be the one doing the interpreting I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. Interpreting difficult texts is hard work, but at least rest in the assurance that it is very good for your mind. Now, Rachel's makes a distinction at the beginning of the article between the Calatians and the Greeks, two different cultures, and their different views on disposing of, a, of their dead. This comparison in, in views between two cultures is meant to underlie what moves many people to believe that there must not be any objective moral truths. The author then lays out the cultural differences argument, which states that because different cultures have different moral codes, therefore there is no objective truth in morality. Now, this is an argument. Because the first statement, that is, the premise, gives a reason to believe the second statement, also known as the conclusion. There are two and only two ways to analyze an argument. We ask, one, are the premises true? And two, do the premises give support for the conclusion? Now, a negative answer to any one of those will suggest that it is not a good argument. But note that one does not analyze an argument correctly if one just decides if the conclusion sounds true. Accepting a claim just because it sounds right is very tempting to do, and it is in fact very common, but it is wrong, wrong, wrong. 
in terms of critical thinking. If you want to be a good critical thinker, you should never base your belief in a claim on whether the claim sounds good. The claim is another term for a conclusion. Although maybe a little confusedly, the premises are also claims as well and may themselves be conclusions of other arguments that need uh, warrant or support. As it happens, the cultural differences argument is invalid. By the way, in one place in the article, he says it is unsound, which is not incorrect, but it is more correct to say that it is invalid. An argument is invalid if the premises do not support the conclusion. More specifically, a valid argument is one where if the premises were to be true, the conclusion must, if it's deductive, or probably will, if it's inductive, we won't go far into the distinction between those two in this uh, course, at least not early on, uh, follow. So let me read that whole sentence uh, there. Uh, an argument is invalid if the premises do not support the conclusion. More specifically, a valid argument is one where if the premises were to be true, the conclusion must or probably will follow. In this case, the cultural differences argument, the premise is about what people believe, whereas the conclusion is about a fact. You will realize quickly that something is not factual just because people believe it. This is an important point to get in this article, so be sure and take the time to understand, uh, understand it or again, get clarification from me or in the forums, and that could be through email or the forums. <clears throat> now, to be fair, just because the argument is invalid doesn't mean the conclusion is not true. The conclusion could be true, even though the argument doesn't give a good reason to think so. In the article, Rachel's next gives some reason to think that the conclusion is not true. He does this by outlining some consequences that would occur if cultural relativism were true. You'll see there uh, on the slide, CR abbreviates cultural relativism so that I can get it all in on one line. This is a reduct reductio ad absurdum argument. The truth of the conclusion would lead to absurd consequences. For instance, if cultural relativism were true, it would seem to follow that we could not criticize other societies. We couldn't criticize our own society and we couldn't make moral progress because our doing these things seems rational and, and right. Cultural relativism must be false, according to Rachel's. Okay. Rachel's goes on to argue that there actually is less disagreement between cultures than it seems. For instance, consider a culture A that has a practice of not eating cows, whereas another culture B has a practice of eating cows. It seems that the two cultures have different values, but on closer inspection, it may turn out that it's not the value that's different. It's the belief, uh, the beliefs in what constitutes a person. Culture A believes that cows contain some manifestation of an ancestor, and they certainly don't want to eat an ancestor. So it turns out that both cultures value human existence. It's just that the beliefs about what is human existence between cultures A and B is different. Similar points are made in the article by Rachel's about Eskimos and infanticide. The last part of the article, uh, in the last part of the article, Rachel's makes the case that we actually have a lot of values in common between cultures. All cultures must have a prohibition on murder, because if they didn't, eventually, if you think about it, the society would not exist. Because people would just scatter out of fear of being murdered, and so would not be a society anymore. Similarly, every society must have a high value on truth-telling, because societies where people were not able to depend on each other to cooperate would soon cease to exist. So some moral rules, it seems logically, must be common between societies for those societies to exist at all. 
However, there are things that can be learned from cultural relativism. It reminds us that not all of our preferences are based on some absolute moral standard. It also urges us to keep an open mind. It is an antidote to the dogmatic belief that our gut feelings about values are rooted in some objective moral truth. I hope this video has been helpful to you and understanding this article. Thank you for your time and attention.